Good evening everyone. Nerd Knight Austin has contacted me recently to make a video on the question Are tabletop roleplay games art? This is the result of that collaboration. Hi everyone. Hi. Have a good evening. Um, hi, my name is Simon Ingram. I'm a tabletop uh, roleplaying game enthusiast and I've been a game master for like 17 years. I also happen to have a YouTube channel where I talk about tabletop roleplaying games and social justice issues. Last of all, I'm also an art graduate. I study that, and I kid you not, the easy school. It means the European Superior School of Image, but yeah, it's, it's the easy school. So I'd say I'm pretty qualified to answer the question, are tabletop roleplaying games art? Google defines art as the expression or application of human creative skill and imagination, producing works to be appreciated primarily for their beauty or emotional power. So tabletop role-playing games do qualify for this definition of art. When they're played, they are an application of human imagination, and people are able to feel their characters' emotions by proxy. So we can say that tabletop role-playing games are appreciated for their emotional power. On top of this definition, I can tell you that art is an ever-expanding concept. In 1970, Marcel Duchamp's urinal was first exposed in a museum. It was the entrance of profane, mundane things into the world of art. Artists have, ever since that moment, pushed the definition of art to its maximum. Every new piece kind of has the aim to expand the question of the answer to the question what is art so you're gonna have more performance and stranger things for example will them void made cloaca this piece of art is a phenomenal work of engineering biology chemistry that turns food into feces what i said this piece of art is a phenomenal work of engineering biology chemistry that turns food into feces could you say that last part louder and slower? It turns food into feces! It's a poop machine! Yes, this thing exists. I can explain everything. Guide me the poop machine, called it art, and sold it for a frightening amount of money. The art market is a money laundering scheme. White men artists sell for crazy prices by having their rich white illegal money friend buy it. And then the friend can resell it later to get clean money. With some tax payoffs, of course. Modern art in museums makes no sense on purpose so that you don't get too curious and find out about the money laundering. I'll tell you about it another time. If we followed the current definition that the art world uses for what is art and what isn't, technically anything can be art and anyone can be an artist. But tabletop role-playing games are a game. Doesn't that disqualify them from being art? This is pretty close to the debate of video games as art. There are a ton of examples of artsy video games that have been, like, mind-blowingly beautiful for the past few years. And a lot of passion goes into developing those games. And also, a lot of art. Artwork goes into production of, of games, and so it, the end result incorporating that art is art, arguably. So, video games match the precise definition we have of art. The emotional power that is described in the definition can be as simple as joy from killing in modern warfare. Yes, that means video games are art, even modern warfare. I feel so much rage every time I play League of Legends. So why do you play? Similarly, tabletop roleplay games have a ton of art that is put into them. You've got the illustrations, you've got the writing, the game theory, the acting. We can also see a lot of examples of tabletop role-playing games that include things like costuming and makeup, crafting props, figuring painting. Like this is art. All of the passion that went into creating this duck figurine monstrosity made it art. This is art. Oh my god. I need you all to roll initiative against Quackthulu. I can also say that 
you know, calligraphy sometimes goes into tabletop role-playing games. I either did myself or had somebody else make like cool looking cool looking letters that my players could get their hands on and read and look over for clues and things like this. The calligraphy just made it more realistic for them. Sometimes singing goes into the performances of tabletop role-playing games. Come on, come on, get your scaling on. It's Thursday night and it won't be long. Gonna play my flute, play my charm. It's Thursday night and it won't be long. Tell I get your health up, get your health up. I got all you need. No, I don't shoot bows, I don't swing swords, but damn, I can sing. <laughs> Sometimes even dancing. Back when I lived in France, I played in a D&D 4th edition game and the game master at some point we were at a ball and we had to look as normal as possible and so one of the when one of the NPCs asked me for a dance the the game master just like stood up and got me to like dance along um, and and it was like this really curious experience because it was awkward for me but it was awkward for my character too because um, I, I, I wasn't expecting to have to do this and neither was my character but it it helped and I feel like that dance is part of the tabletop experience that I had that night. We also sometimes mix in culinary arts, like cooking, you know, not just when you go to a friend's house and they made something nice for D&D night, but there's all this stuff. So for example, when I did a Game of Thrones type game with like a lot of politics, at some point I, uh, at some point, one of the NPCs invited all of the players for a meal, um, a public meal where there was going to be like some assassins, and there was going to be an there was going to be an assassination attempt. One of the characters, uh, one of the player characters, was going to be in danger of dying by poison. Um, and so what I did is that I spent two days cooking this big meal for all of my friends. I got, uh, I went to a place that had this nice ancient looking table and this candelabra um, and I got two of my friends to play the NPCs and I feel like the cooking that I, that I did while thinking of like what the story was going to be like, I, I feel like that was part of the experience and there when they were eating the food while, you know, they, they came in, they came in hungry and they were eating the food while they were role-playing with my friends who had just like a little idea of what was going on but who improv so majestically. Sometimes poetry ends up in tabletop role-playing games. Like I know I use poetry all the time when I write prophecies and I like including spoilers in my story so I do prophecies like a lot. You also have arguably designs for architecture in some of the illustrations and the maps. And if you wanted to say like this is the like all of the arts that are that can be included in tabletop role-playing games, you could add filmmaking because Critical Role has been making videos out of the process of playing the game. You could add photography because some games use photography instead of illustrations. There's just so many art forms that can be added at like every single step of the game. But if all of the things that are art that are included in tabletop role-playing games are what add up to make role-playing games art, well, could you take art out of tabletop role-playing games and have it not be art? The answer is no. Even the most basic one-page games have storytelling and acting woven into them. And those are both performative arts that will go into the process of playing those games. John Wick himself, when he was writing his book, said, Oh, oh yeah, we have a John Wick as well. Uh, he's the one who wrote the TGMing. It's, it's not a sexual thing. It's not as sexual as it sounds. It's just about being like... It's just about looking like an asshole game master to make your players feel like af afraid. That's what, that's what dirty GMing made. So 
So, in his book, John Wick, this John Wick, uh, talks about how theater breaks the fourth wall. The fourth wall, when you're at, at the play, is like the wall that should exist for the for the actors and the, and the characters that separates the actors from the audience. When you break the fourth wall, um, when you address the crowd or you, you make a, a comment or a joke that only the crowd can understand, not the characters in the fiction, you're breaking the fourth wall. In that moment, the audience becomes part of the event. That is what happens as a consequence of the fourth wall being broken. John Wick says that tabletop role-playing games go even further because they break the fifth wall. The audience are the event in this case. It's more than just addressing the audience, he tells me. It's making the audience feel as if they're part of the event. What about the fifth wall, I ask him. What's that? I smile. Making them feel that they are the event. This is an argument that came before the popularity of Critical Role, where the players are professional actors, and so arguably the audience isn't them, but the millions of people who are watching. But even then, the process of acting involves, you know, being the audience to the other person that you're acting against. So even those actors are the audience to their own work of art. John Wick proposes the idea that tabletop role-playing games blur the line between artist, art, and audience. When I play, when I play, I'm the storyteller, but I'm also the audience of my players. And together, and together we are the performance. We are the art piece. And so because it combines all of those things together and puts the player in a state where their imagination is being called upon, Tabletop role-playing games are the most immersive art form that I have ever encountered. And I've encountered, you know, quite a few because I was in art school. This subject can be extended to one more distinction, the difference between high art and crafts. Historically, the line has been clear to determine what is a craft and what is high art. That line is the number of white men who are involved with the activity. If there's a lot, it's high art. To perform crafting is to gender female. The exceptions to this gendering, that a man who practices woodcraft or who hones his writing craft is a manly man of the Ron Swanson or Ernest Hemingway variety, respectively, tend to only reinforce rather than subvert the general sense that in US culture, crafting is a thing lonely single ladies or lonely bored housewives or lonely empty nested moms do. And it certainly isn't art. Crafts are moderately useful at best and useless frivolous junk at worst. Although some deny its continued existence, there remains a hierarchy in the art world. Craft processes rank lower than disciplines such as video or sculpture. This extends even further. Among crafts, textiles are one of the least well regarded. This highlights issues of gender and value. Textiles are feminine, often made by women, and part of the domestic sphere. Prejudice against the feminine continues to be pervasive and used to diminish these works of art. The debasement of craft is yet another method of the continued marginalization of women in the art world. Cooking is a chore at home which was traditionally associated with women, but kitchen chefs practice the culinary arts. The artificial divide that exists between fine art and textiles, or applied and decorative arts or crafts, is a gendered issue. Historically, textiles have been labeled women's work and dismissed as inferior to pursuits such as painting and sculpture. For example, sewing is associated with women, but a lot of the most famous fashion designers who do art are men. So, what ends up in museums is often decided by the white men in charge. And let me tell you, there are a lot of white men in the hobby of tabletop role-playing games. But things are progressing. There's new and more inclusive games that are coming out every year. Games with less illustrations of fat characters in villain roles and more in player character roles. 
games that have rules for wheelchair use for representation of disabled people. Games with casual representation of queer people and the concept of queerness. Is it clear <laughs> that I'm in the queer community if I have my trans dice mug and my sorry dad but I'm a fully automated luxury s a gay space communist? Uh. Games that don't use mental illness tropes and stereotypes for horror. <coughs> Games that don't have fascist imagery associated with the good guys. <coughs> Games without sexist illustrations. <coughs> Games that don't associate dark-skinned races with the evil alignment. <coughs> and games that don't rely on xenophobic literature as a source of material. The more we have games like these coming out, the more we'll have an image of a hobby that is more inclusive and more people will want to join. This will make the gaming community for tabletop role-playing games more diverse. When this happens, some disgruntled white men will argue that their hobby is being overtaken and will stop defending tabletop role-playing games as an art form. Of course it's not art because it's a mass-produced entertainment game. That's not high art. So yeah, tabletop role-playing games are art, which means I have been practicing art diligently ever since I left art school and not let my training and talents go to waste for years because capitalism gives very little time to practice. Go forth, do art, pick up a local game and break the fifth wall.